Welcome to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School. My name is Robert Blaze and I'll be studying the Bible with you. And this quarter, we have a brand new lesson. We'll be talking about education. We're going to look at scripture through the lens of education. We're going to look at things like what's the purpose of education, the methods uh, that can be used. We're going to look at the importance of it as well as the role of scripture and the goal of God in education. And we'll be studying all of this right here on ABT. Welcome once again to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School. Today we are starting a brand new quarter. And so before we go any further, let's start with prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for having the privilege to study scripture. Father, this great book is the only book that we can fully depend on to teach us, Lord, the true and great lessons of life. And Father, it is only through you and through your Holy Spirit that we can be taught accurately. And so, Father, I pray that today you be our great teacher, showing us, Lord, the great truth of life, the great truth that we need to understand to prepare us, Lord, for whatever comes our way. And Father, I am unworthy at this time to even speak your word. And so, Lord, I cannot do this unless you, Lord, help me. And I pray, Lord, that you will put your words in my mouth, help me to speak, clear my mind from everything. And I pray that all of us that are here to listen to you, Lord, will hear your words through me. Father, I pray that you soften all of our hearts and that you prepare our, our minds to absorb, Lord, all the material that you have for us. I ask, Father, that you forgive us for our, our sins, Lord, all the things that we've done, Lord, to um, destroy all that you're trying to do, Lord, forgive us and cleanse us at this time and help us, Lord, to be faithful and to walk in your way. And I thank you for this moment and I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. Today, as we start a new quarter, we'll be talking about education. We're going to be looking at scripture through the lens of education. And in a real sense, we're all really students in this great drama of life. We are all being taught new lessons every day. From the moment we are born to the time that we take our last breath, we are learning something. We're absorbing data and we need to do something with that information. Now, we often look at education from the sole perspective of schooling. And it is true that it's a big bulk of our education, but it's not just that. It goes way beyond that. It doesn't end there. It doesn't even start there. In fact, every new chapter of life brings new sets of lessons. Every experience teaches us something new, something to, to do with, um, with life. Scripture is also the most important book, the most important textbook, because not only does it teach us things about God and about the future, but it helps us to prepare for decisions today. And as these decisions are being made, it prepares us for the future and for life eternal. Now, I also like to submit to you that at any point in time, we are either a student or a teacher. And so we're going to look a little bit at the difference between these two. And finally, we need to remember that we are involved in the school of Christ. Every day, Christ is teaching us lessons because he has a purpose for us. As our great teacher, he is preparing us uh, to be a lot more than what we are now. And I'd like to start by reading these two fabulous quotes that will give us an idea of what true education is all about. So the first one is from... Christian Education, page 63. It says, The true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. And I'm going to put that on the board here. It says that the true object, so the true object of education, and we have to keep that in mind throughout the whole quarter as we're going to be studying because we need to remember that is to restore the image of God in the soul. Uh, we all know we were created in the image of God, but that image has been marred. And so the true object of education is to restore that image. The quote goes on, 
In the beginning, God created men in his own likeness. He endowed him with noble qualities. His mind was well balanced and all the powers of his being were harmonious. But the fall and its effect have perverted these gifts. Sin has marred and well nigh obliterated the image of God in man. It was so, it was to restore this, that the plan of salvation was devised, and a life of probation was granted to man to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, is the great object of life, the object that underlies every other. It is the work of parents and teachers in the education of the youth to cooperate with the divine purpose and in so doing, they are laborers together with God. And so the great object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. And this other quote here, it's from Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 37. It says, the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ expressed in character is the highest education. It is the key that opens the portal of the heavenly city. The, this knowledge, it is God's purpose that all who put on Christ shall possess. And so to restore the image of God is to restore the character to what it ought to be. And the character has to be a righteous character, a character of righteousness, just like Jesus, just like God. And so our memory text today is found in the book of Job, chapter 36. So if you have your Bible with me, go to Job 36. We'll be reading verse 22. It says, fascinating statement, Behold, God exalted by his power, who teacheth like him? So here we have a question asking, who teaches like God teaches? Because God is the greatest teacher, but his method of education, especially by today's standard, would be considered very, very unorthodox. Um, today, we, we think of education mostly from, from books. Like we read books, we have textbooks. We, we think a lot of intellectual development, now, a little bit of practical. But God is not just interested in that. He doesn't neglect the intellectual. He doesn't neglect the physical. But the primary thing that he's interested in is to develop character. His methods are varied. He uses law, nature, experiences, miracle, witnessing, prophecy. All these things packaged together is for the sole purpose of developing character. His methods are, are varied and they go beyond just the mere intellectual textbook that we're so used to. When giving the law to Israel, this is what Moses said to the Israelite in Deuteronomy 4 verses 5 through 8. It says in verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land whether ye go to possess it. And so here we have Moses that's teaching the Israelite the laws and the statutes, but why is he doing that? Because God commanded it, of course. But what we need to understand is that God commanded Moses to teach but he first taught Moses. Moses saw, sat before God as a student, and God taught him the commandment. He taught him the statute, and then he told Moses, okay, now, now that you know these things, you go and you teach. You become the teachers, and these will be your students. And so there's this idea of, you know, being a teacher meaning that you, you basically tell the things that you have learned. It was... Um, something that uh, one of my teachers said in university that I actually really appreciated. He says, I'm your teacher today, but really I'm not so much different than you. I've just been studying a little longer than you have. And so he was only teaching really what he had studied in the past. And so we are all in this path of learning. And whatever we've learned, we can be a teacher of that knowledge. Now going back to Moses, verse 6 says, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who had God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? 
And what nation is there so great that had statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? You see, even the pagan nation around Israel, they would look at the system of law, the system of, of ceremony that God had implemented, and that would witness to them, and they would be so impressed that they would acknowledge the wisdom of God. They would see that God was indeed a great teacher. Of course, that was dependent on the Israelite to follow those great teaching, but it was designed to also show and teach other nations about God's greatness. So today, as we look at education, we're looking at the education in the Garden of Eden. And we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at the first school. And then we're going to look at authority. And these are two very important topics. Um, as we know, anything that we learn from Scripture, any truth, finds its basis in Genesis. In the first few chapters of Genesis, in fact, you can find all the great truth of the Bible. And then as we look at authority, we're going to try to need to understand a little bit why that is important and the impact that it has on our lives. So let's talk about the first school. Our first school was the school of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And so let's go to Genesis, and we're going to spend some time in Genesis chapter 2. Beginning in verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Now listen up, it says, The name of the first is Pison, that is, which compasses the whole land of Avila, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, and there is Bedellium and Onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittical, that is, which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, here we have a description a little bit of the school that God established. It was in Eden, and in Eden there was a section, and it was a garden, and there is where he put the man. That was to be his school. Now, we understand that before Scripture, the textbook, the, the only lesson book that really man had was nature. It was through nature that God would teach many things. Now, we've just read a lot of things about the geography uh, around Eden. We've read about some of the trees that God had planted, including the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But if you think about it, when Jesus was on earth and he was teaching a lot of the lesson that he used a lot of the things that he taught in parable actually came from nature he would talk about a lot about seed sowing and how they grow and he would talk about sheep he would talk about farming he would talk about uh gardening he would talk about all these different little things that are everyday occurrence and, and things that you can see in nature all the time um, you think about the the mustard seed Right, that's another one of them. All these different things God would use, Jesus would use as an illustration to teach about spiritual things and great truth. And it was the same in Eden. It says in verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. You see, some of the first lesson, first things that Adam was taught had to do with manual labor had to do with him taking care of the garden and it would teach him all sorts of things the environment that he lived in would teach him stuff about God it would teach him about himself and he would learn about his creator and about the universe and here comes one of the great lesson in verse 16 it says and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
Now, there's something interesting here that we need to pay attention because when Adam and Eve were created, they were created perfect. They were in the image and in the likeness of God. They were perfect. There was no defect. But that did not mean that there was no room for development. In fact, there's this very erroneous and, and very perverted idea of what perfection is all about, especially in certain circles of the church. Um, it's been used as a strawman argument against people who desire to obey God in everything. And it's cast a lot of fear and caused a lot of discouragement in the heart of a lot of people who would want to obey God. And so they just, they don't see any point anymore because they feel that sin is something that you cannot escape. Perfection is wrongly described as a stage or a place that one can attain. And once there, the man has reached the fullness of humanity and there's nothing else that this individual can reach for. It's like saying that it's become like God. I actually don't know anyone who believes in that definition. The only people I know who believe in that is people who actually don't believe in perfection, which is kind of an oxymoron. And so true biblical, and, uh, yeah, true biblical perfection, true biblical perfection is not a final place of attainment. It is not that. And the best way for me to illustrate that is to talk about Adam. You see, when Adam was created, he was perfect. But you know what? He could still grow. There were still many things for him to learn and to apply in life. Everything he knew did bear the stamp of perfection. He did it properly. He did it well. But he was still growing. He was still learning and improving. And it is the same thing for us. Every time we learn something, we continue and we grow. And that's why the tree of knowledge of good and evil was there. It was to permit him to make a choice. So that as he made a choice, it would allow him to grow and to perfect his righteousness and to grow in righteousness. If there is no choice, there is no possibility for growth. You cannot grow. And in the same way, if God had created Adam perfect, without the need or the possibility to grow, then that cho choice would not have existed. That tree would not have been there. The very fact that the tree was there proves, proves the fact that there was a choice that was available. It proves the fact that Adam, though perfect, could still grow. Because otherwise, that tree would have been useless. And if Adam didn't need to grow, if he didn't need to choose, then he would have never made the wrong choice because that would have been an imperfect choice. So the fact that Adam could choose between two different things shows us that growth is possible and that perfection is something that we grow into. So I, I hope that you know, makes it a little bit easier to understand what true perfection is all about. Let me read this uh, passage here to try to clarify that in the book, Education, page 15. It says, When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. God created man in his own image, Genesis 1.27. It was his purpose that the longer man live, the more fully he should reveal this image, the more fully reflect the glory of the Creator. All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor were continually to increase. Vast was the scope offered to their exercise. Glorious the field open to their research. The mystery of the visible universe, the wondrous work of him which is perfect in knowledge, invited man's study. Face to face, heart to heart communion with his maker was his high privilege. Had he remained loyal to God all this world, have been his forever. Throughout eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh springs of happiness, and to obtain clearer and, let, and yet clearer conception of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. More and more fully would he have been, would he have fulfilled the object of his creation, more and more fully have reflected the creator glory. And so there is a principle of growth that was 
uh, placed in Eden, and that is still available to us today. Now, going back to our passage, uh, continuing in verse 18, uh, we look a little bit at some of the other lesson that God had to teach him. And the Lord God said, It is not good that men should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. And for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. You see, God through the animals was teaching important lessons to Adam. In fact, Job 35, 11 tells us, Who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven? You know, God is the one who teaches us more than that, but the beasts teach us a lot of things. The uh, fowls of the air teaches us a, a lot of things. So there is many things for us to learn from the animal kingdom. And one of the things that Adam learned as he was looking at all these animals, as he was realizing there was a male and a female and a male and a female, he was realizing, how come I am alone of my kind? It's nice you know, to have a pet, you know, to have a cat or a dog, but it doesn't fulfill in the same way as an other human being does. And so Adam realized that his social interaction, though he was happy, could be improved and he, could, he, he needed more, basically. And so in verse 21 we read, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And that was a great revelation for Adam, the importance of another being, especially uh, as Eve became Adam's wife. There was uh, th this new field of, of uh, relationship, this new field of things for him to learn, to experience, and to enjoy. It was completely at a different level. And so he was learning even more. And so within the environment that God had provided, our first parent had, had all the important um, aspects of life in front of them, all the important information for them to learn and to grow. And they would have continued, except we understand and we know that they chose differently. And they sinned, they made a mistake, and because of that, they decided to follow the teaching of another. And in Genesis 3, we read, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now obviously we see here that um, Eve misquoted God. She did not properly understood the lesson, or at least she didn't take them as seriously as she should have. And as a, as a result, we should see this as a big warning from us, like, like large warning, that there's many things that God has taught us, but how, how seriously do we take them? How seriously do we take the teaching from Scripture, even if it looks like a small thing, even, you know, we're trying to look for loophole. But what about the consequences and how large it is? And we should be serious with them. Uh, we often use our, our judgment when we come to certain situations. We analyze them based on how we, we think. And we, we determine that perhaps God was not really that serious about that aspect. And then we just follow our own judgment. And the consequences are oftentimes very disastrous. And, and this is exactly what happened. You know, if... If God was not serious, he would not bother telling us certain things. If his laws were not important, he would not have bothered giving them to us. If the plan of salvation was not important, he would not have bothered putting it together. 
And quite frankly, if sin was not so grievous and important, it would not have needed Jesus to come and die for our sins. And so we need to remember these things. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. He sees way beyond what we can see with our finite human vision. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And, woman, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now when you look at this passage, you, you discover that the, what the serpent is basically doing is that he's insinuating doubt. He's trying to bring doubt in the mind. Uh, clearly, what, whatever the serpent was teaching at that time, it was different than what Eve had learned. In fact, it was absolutely contrary. And, and here's another lesson for us. When we hear something that is contrary from what we have known, we shouldn't just jump the gun and accept it as new truth. We should research. We should be careful. We should ask ourselves. We should prove it. We should not just accept whatever anyone has to say, any teacher, even a teacher that we would trust. I would never tell my students, just trust my word. Never. You go and you find out for yourself. You go and research. You go and make sure that what is being said is true, even if the source is very reputable. In the garden, when you think about it, for all appearances, that serpent looked like one of God's creature. It was one of God's creature, but it was being manipulated by somebody else. And it's interesting because when you listen to what the serpent was saying, he said, you shall be as gods. If you eat of that fruit, you're going to be like gods. Something's wrong there because... Uh, God, when he created Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 27, he says, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. He created man in his likeness and his image. They were already like God in image and in likeness. But the serpent was insinuating that they were not that God was withholding and did not give them everything that he could, but that the fruit could do that. The fruit could give them what God had refused to give them. So not only was the serpent saying that God was lying and that they would die, but he, that he was withholding truth and knowledge and important things from them, but that that fruit could impart that to them. But the truth is, God had given them everything at their disposition to grow and to learn. And so, whatever the serpent was saying was a bold-faced lie. But the manner in which he introduced it, the doubt that he in infiltrated in the mind of Eve, completely short-circuited her, and she didn't think clearly. And of course, the consequences of, of Eve's action and then in turn of Adam's action are innumerable. What we see today is not what God had planned. The great lesson book of nature that God had designed to teach us about himself and about goodness and about eternal things and all these great are now marred by sin. We read in Genesis 3, 18, 19, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So we see from this that how God had designed nature is not what we see now. The, the lesson that were to be gained now in, in nature would also teach us about the consequences of sin and the danger of sin. It would teach us about death, about evil, about decay, and all these different things that were not there originally. Destruction and aging and pain. 
And now we can observe all these things in nature which was not necessary for us. And all that came as a consequence of a wrong choice. The book Education, 20, page 26, we read, Although the earth was blighted with the curse, nature was still to be man's lesson book. It could not now represent goodness only, for evil was everywhere present, marrying the earth and sea and air with its defiling touch. Where once was written only the character of God, the knowledge of good was now also written the character of Satan, the knowledge of evil. From nature, which now revealed the knowledge of good and evil, man was continually to receive warning as to the results of sin. In drooping flower and falling leaf, Adam and his companion witnessed the first sign of decay. Vividly was brought to their mind the stern fact that every living thing must die. Even the air upon which their life depended bore the seeds of death. Continually they were reminded also of their lost dominion. Among the lower creatures, Adam had stood as a king, and so long as he remained loyal to God, all nature acknowledged his rule. But when he transgressed, this dominion was forfeited. The spirit of rebellion to which he himself had given entrance extended throughout the animal creation. Thus, not only the life of man, but the nature of the beasts, the trees of the forest, the grass of the field, the very air he breathed, all told the sad lesson of the knowledge of evil. Not only, unfortunately for them and for us, the lesson now that Adam and Eve would learn would be quite different. They lost their their one-on-one -on -one personal communion with their God, with their great teacher. And now they would learn the terrible lesson and the price of sin. But they would also learn about the truth of the gospel and about salvation and about forgiveness. And that's what we see in Genesis 3.15. It's the first time that we, we learn about how God is not abandoning us. But think about it. We, when fall comes, autumn, we, we look at the trees and they're changing color and it's, it's nice, it's beautiful, it's all sorts of hues of, of red and yellow and gold. But when you think about it, when Adam first saw that, can you imagine when he first saw the first leaf of a tree fall off? I can only imagine him crying, realizing this is a consequence of my sin, of what I have done. And so everywhere on earth we see these different things that sometimes we don't realize it, but they should not have been there and they were not there in the first place. Some of the things that we also learn in Genesis, in verse 21 we read, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. You know, in order to provide those coats of skin, some animal had to die. Some animal had to be sacrificed. And this is the first hint of the sacrificial service that God would institute, which would foreshadow the great sacrifice that God himself would make in Jesus. And from, from them, of course, the system grew where we have the whole sanctuary service, where we learn all the details actually of the plan of salvation. The, the whole sanctuary service is a giant school of salvation to teach us how God would take care of sin in types and shadows. And so these are some of the, uh, the ideas that we can see in, in the first school that God had established and, and what he was hoping to achieve. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about authority. Authority. You see, the relationship between a student and a teacher is, in a real sense, about authority. A teacher comes with authority, with a, a certain amount of, of oversight, if you will. When Eve accepted the teaching of the serpent, she also accepted his authority over her and moved God's authority away from her. And so whether we... Uh, we be one who is learning and we are a teacher, whether we are in university or kindergarten, even at church, the person that stands speaking has authority. He speaks the things 
with authority and, and therefore comes responsibility and duty. And such responsibility and duties ought to be taken very seriously. Very, very much seriously. God takes it seriously. Look what James says in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, My brethren, be not many masters. And the word masters here means teacher. Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. And that scares me to stand here. Because it speaks about a greater condemnation. Why? Because whatever is being spoken out of the mouth of a teacher has an impact on a student. And the impact can either bring them to eternal life, closer to it, or closer to eternal damnation. And so there is a, a huge amount of responsibility that befalls on a teacher. And it is important to pray for our teachers in our schools and in our churches to make sure that they are anointed by God, by the Spirit of God, that they speak the word of truth and the word of Scripture, that they may not lead anyone astray. For God knows and we know that there are many teachers and false teachers out there that speaks things that are incorrect, that are wrong, and brings people into damnation. This was the case in the time of Jesus, Matthew 23, 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you come past sea and land to make one proselyte. A proselyte is, mean, means a convert, somebody who follows the teacher, which was the scribe of the Pharisees. He says, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. What Jesus was saying is very simple. These teachers were making people worse than what, than what they would have been without them. In, in Eden, the devil had only one goal, and it, it was to mess up the human family with false teaching. And false teachers are everywhere. They're in the educational system, and unfortunately, they are also in our church. And Paul warned in Acts 20, verse 29, 30, he says, For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So it's not a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise because we were warned. There are false teachers. There are false Christs. There are false prophets. There are false teachers. And they're there and all they're trying to do is to deceive. Sometimes those teachers, they're well-meaning. They think they are right unless, until they realize that they have been deceived. But sometimes they know they're being deceived, but they don't care because they're looking for something else. They're not looking to impart truth. They're looking for a following. They're looking for, for people to acknowledge them, for fame or whatever they're looking for. And so we have to be attentive. We cannot let falsehood detract us from the path that God has set us on upon. If their interest is not in the truth, then we shouldn't have any interest in what they have to say. Peter warned of similar thing in 2 Peter 2, in verses uh, 1 uh, through 17, 17. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And so these are really strong words. They're trying to make merchandise of you. They're playing with you. They're using you with their, their what was the word, pernicious ways and their feigned words. They bring damnable heresies. And unless we're attentive, unless we are student at the feet of Jesus and we look at the word, we will be swayed. We have to be good students. 
Because it's not just being a good teacher, we also have to be good student, and good students are Berean. Acts 17, 10 to 11 says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scripture daily whether those things were so. And so they did not just receive everything, but they also did not just reject everything. They accepted what was said. Okay, I've heard what you say. Now, let me go and do my research. Let me go find out if these things are so. If Eve would have done that, if Eve would have received whatever the serpent has to say, okay, I listen, I heard what you say. Now, let me go find out if that is true. If she would have gone back and compared the teaching, maybe she could have gone back to God. Listen, I've heard these things. Can we talk? Can we have a discussion here? Can we, can we look at that? Maybe our condition today would have been different. If you think about it, of all the, the things that has happened in our past and the decisions that we have made, and oftentimes based on wrong information, what if we would have taken a little bit more time to think about it, to research? Where would we be today? Where would our church be today? Maybe if we did not reject so much what some of our pioneer had to say, or what the spirit of prophecy had to say, or what Jesus had to say. Maybe we'd be in a different place today. The warning is, is to students as much as it is to teacher. We have to be good students, and we have to be good teacher. Speaking to Timothy, Paul write these words in 2 Timothy 4, 1-5. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. So Paul instructs Timothy of the way he should conduct his ministry. And he ought to be solid in his ministry, not to be swayed. Why? Because he says in verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, and after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Paul warns that people have itching ears, meaning they don't like to hear certain things. And because they don't like to hear certain things, they don't accept these things. You know, we, we live in a time, for example, in our church where we don't like to hear about sin. We don't like to hear about sin. We, we like to hear about love and about grace. Love is great, and sin is great. No, not sin, sorry. Love is great, and, and uh, grace is great. But the problem is that we need to hear about sin also, because sin is a problem that we need to face. If we don't look at the problem, we're never going to be able to find the solution. And if we don't understand the problem of sin, we're not going to understand the solution of salvation and of Jesus Christ. We can't just ignore it. I had this, this software on, on the spirit of prophecy, and I, and I decided to do a, a quick research just for fun. So I typed in love just to find out how many hits I would get. And I got about 10,000-ish uh, hits. That's quite a lot of quotes about love. And then I decided, you know what, let me check sin. And when I checked sin, I had over 30,000 hits. That's three times as much. Why? Because sin is a problem that we need to pay attention for. And we cannot be having itching ears. We cannot, I don't want to hear this. I'm not interested. No, we have to hear sometime the unpleasant truth. Now, I'm not talking unpleasant people who speak unpleasantly. I'm talking about the truth that makes us uncomfortable because they tug at the heart. Because they tell us that, listen, something's wrong, and you need to fix it. You need to accept that there's a problem, because if you don't accept that there's a problem, you won't be able to accept the solution, and you won't be able to change. And we need, 
If your ears itch, that's not such a bad thing. Let it itch and then find the solution and they'll stop itching. We have to start to, first of all, we have to stop putting teacher who speaks smooth truth. We have to start lifting up teacher who speak truth, whether it's smooth or not, whether it hurts or not. We have to stop self-deceiving ourselves because otherwise we're not going to make it. We're not going to achieve what God wants to achieve in our life. We are self-destructing ourselves when we do that. So, yes, there are bad teachers, but don't be a bad student. Be a good student. Education, page 30. And this is my last quote that I want to leave you with today. It says, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. For in education as in redemption, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It was the good pleasure of the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Under change condition, true education is still conformed to the Creator's plan, the plan of the Eden school. Adam and Eve receive instruction through direct communion with God. We behold the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Christ. The great principles of education are unchanged. They stand fast forever and ever. For they are the principles of the character of God. To aid the student in comprehending these principles and in entering into that relation with Christ, which will make them a controlling power in the life, should be the teacher's first effort and his constant aim. The teacher who accepts this aim is in truth a co-worker with Christ, a laborer together with God. Let us pray. Father, we... We come to you this morning humble. Father, we come to you today humble, knowing that you have a plan for us, that we must learn of you, that from the very beginning you wanted something for us. But how many times did we fail to learn the lesson? And yet, Lord, you are still patiently showing us the truth, showing us where we ought to be, showing us the way. Uh, Father, I pray as we continue to study your word, as we continue to open the scripture, that you continue to teach us the great purpose of education, that our character may be changed and may be ready for heaven. So that, Father, when Jesus comes, we can be taken to heaven. That there, Lord, we may continue to grow in the fullness that you had prepared for us forever and ever. I thank you, Lord, for never having abandoned us, but having given us everything that we need to succeed in this life. Thank you, Father, for your love, for your grace and for your education. I pray this in the name of our Lord and our Savior and our righteousness, Jesus. Amen.